There's the ding. All right, everyone. Today's amazing presentation is going to revolve around flat file CMSs. Uh, I think by the end of it, you might think that it is the greatest thing to happen to developers since Vim. A, a large portion of this is, is going to discuss a little bit about um, databases. So to get started is a little funny joke about databases and snapshots and one of the things that's not great about it. So uh, to just a quick introduction for myself, uh, I'm Drew Ackerman. I, my daily job is in quality assurance and I develop and maintain automated solutions for uh, clients. Uh, <laughs> I usually have 20 fingers and so many different pies, and I read and I learn constantly, and it leads me to discover some interesting things that, that I'm going to share with you today. Um, that's also part about being uh, at SCG, and an important part is having our marketability, maintaining expertise in what we do, and working at growing into new areas. Um, for me to, to maintain that marketability, working on projects seems to be a really effective way to do that, learning new concepts and providing a demonstration of what I can do. And part of that idea was I wanted to set up a blog as a platform to show sort of incremental learning, learning something new about TypeScript, perfect, put on the blog, learning something new about quality assurance, perfect, write up an article, put it on the blog is kind of the end goal of what I wanted to do. In the past, I've tried to set up blogs and, and work with tools like WordPress, uh, which is a common CMS that we're going to talk a little bit about later. Uh, but there's always that one thing that I just didn't like interacting with, something that was like the bedrock of every content management system. And so in this presentation, we're going to talk about what a CMS is, like how, why you would want to possibly ditch a database because it is one of the most frustrating things as developers we, we deal with. Uh, commonly, we try to abstract uh, as much as we can away uh, from using databases to make our lives easier. Um, I'll make a couple of recommendations around like a language choice that I think would be really beneficial. Uh, if, if by the time I give you that language uh, suggestion, you don't run away screaming, uh, then we'll switch into a framework recommendation, and then at the end of it, I'll have maybe a couple ideas on what you can do with this overall uh, idea going forward. So content management systems are really great at allowing collaboration around creating content. So a common, a common thing that you need to do when you're making content is creating, editing, deleting it, uh, collaboration, and distribution. And every content management system needs to allow that tool, that, that uh, capability for its users. If it can't do these base three things, then it's not an effective content management system. Uh, so the few types that we have are traditional headless and decoupled. Uh, we'll go into some further discussion a little bit. Um, really, the, the, the three changes that are super important between the three is really how you decouple the certain parts of the application that you're working with. So, you know, there are CMSs that work with just the back end. There are some that provide a full stack solution. There's some where you need to use two applications between the front end and the back end. Um, some of them are very opinionated in the tools you use. Some of them are really just a collection of options and you get to choose what you want and put together to make your content management system for your particular needs. So that, that first one, that headless, would be only the back end. It's just going to have all your content, usually in a database, and it's going to present that content across an API. So you'll make an API request to the, to the back end. It'll use those requests to get you to collate the data um, in however kind of way you want it. And then it's going to send the data back to you, and then you need to take it and you know inject it into your your front end through templates or components or however you've chosen to organize that. Um, so headless CMS options really focus on making that content and API generation as easy as possible, uh, as simple as they can do it. 
and then leaving up the rest to you. That decoupled though takes the the headless and then adds a front end to it. So you're usually working with like two distinct applications. Um, one for the back end again, one for that front end. And the front end can be, you know, an angular front end or a view front end or a React front end. It doesn't really um, matter what you what you put together with it. And then the last solution would be traditional content management systems uh, where it's one application, but you have your back end and your front end, but it's not going to be a front end that's like a distinct application that you'll make an API request to. I guess you could consider it like a more monolithic strategy uh, when you're building this, that, that content management system. Uh, so when we're talking about standard content management systems, most popular ones, and this is a list of them, you've probably heard about WordPress. That's probably the biggest one. I believe 80% of content management systems are WordPress based just because it has such a big, um, or it's just solution space, really this idea that anyone can really set up a, a simple shared server. Uh, account, <laughs> really cheap hosting, throw some WordPress on there, throw a couple plugins, and you can have a website running in less than a day. Um, but you'll, you'll have a little bit less control over what you're doing um, just because they're so heavily opinionated. And the one thing that all of these, all of these content management choices have is they all have a database, every single one of them. Uh, Whichever one you pick, they all have that backend database. And for me, that was one of the hardest things to work with uh, was a database because I can get back in, I can understand front end. You get me into a database, and my my productivity just grinds to a halt. It's just for one of those reasons, it never really made sense with me. Uh, it was always a task to get that database up and running. It was always a task to get some sort of mapping system to grab those objects for me. And and make them into those those um, other objects that I could use in the back end, and then shove it out the API. And that's interesting. It's interesting that they even have databases to to begin with. And I think the reason they have databases is because databases kind of work with any solution is one thing. Um, they do address this issue of growth. Uh, this idea that I need to have the perfect solution for right now that needs to scale to Amazon levels because I'm going to have a business that's going to grow exponentially for the next 10 years. And I need to be ready. So I need a database. I need it to be fast. I need it to be uh, absolutely amazing. And I think, I think back years ago, years and years and years ago, um, when the web was becoming a bigger thing in the in the early 2000s, late 90s, that efficiency was just so incredibly important. And users' computers didn't have much power, so you could not do computing on their side. And you had to rely on making efficient queries, efficient uh, record combinations, efficient joins. You had to do as much as you could server-side, and you had to do it as efficiently as possible because the hardware you were running on was just incredibly, well, slow compared to today's standards. I mean, for example, in 2000, you could buy a Dell server that had an Intel Xeon processor, and it ran at one gigahertz. I don't even know if you can get a consumer grade mobile processor that runs less than or at one gigahertz. So speed and efficiency mattered. And you could do things with a database that you just could not do um, without it. But there's kind of a problem with the database. Again, they're they're a hammer. They're this huge solution on trying to solve something that's probably not necessary for the majority of websites, especially uh, small business uh, owned and ran websites. It's just not needed. And it's not needed for when we are trying to do demo websites. It's not needed when we're trying to get something up and going as fast as we can. Databases have problems. So I'm going to make a crazy 
recommendation. And I'm going to say we go back to the basics. We strip out those added functionalities. We take away indexing. We take away relationships. We take away those triggers and procedures and validation from our data storage solution. And we say, we don't want any of that. And we definitely do not want to have to learn another language. We don't want to learn SQL or something else. And we don't want to have to deploy a secondary server application and manage it and manage its users and manage its security and manage um, keeping it up to date, all of that. We do not want to manage that. So to, to do that, I say we go, we go back to the future. And we go back to a time before any of us, we go back to a time before development was sane, and we go back to a time where uh, before, before databases, we go down to the foundation of databases and we say, let's go to files. We're gonna just deal with files all the way down. And we're gonna do, we're gonna ditch the database and just work with files. So we're gonna work with files because they're performant even though, again, time and time again, we're told files are bottlenecked, IO is the bottleneck, and they're absolutely right. IO can be a bottleneck when you're talking about working with things like an Amazon solution <laughs> or you're global, or you're talking about it's a bottleneck compared to the hundreds of thousands or millions of calculations you could possibly do. It is a bottleneck because <laughs> you have to wait when our processors are so much faster at crunching data. I don't want to wait. And I understand that. But it's not as much as a bottleneck as we might think it is. For a majority of our use cases, it's not a bottleneck. For, for our blog sites, it's not a bottleneck. <laughs> if we can get our data out into the user still in like a couple hundred milliseconds, I'm, I'm confident in saying it's not a bottleneck. Another advantage is that files are inherently as secure as the OS and privileges that we define in the code. I believe it is a lot harder <laughs> to, to gain access to an OS, an OS's file system rather than trying to crack into a database. Uh, whether it's, it's a lot harder to social engineer yourself into the privileges of Linux than it is to social engineer yourself into just the right uh, password or finding it in plain text in, in our repositories that we sometimes accidentally leave it there. Another thing is that files are incredibly simple. We don't need to, again, manage another application. Uh, and we don't need to learn this entire new language or concepts of working with stuff. We're very familiar with working with files. We're very confident that we can push and pull data from them because we do it all the time in addition to working with those databases. Also a great thing is that they're very cost effective. Uh, files, I don't know if you know this, but they're open source. It's really great. There's no licensing. There's no, there's no, uh, <laughs> um, procedures that you really need to understand to work with a file. Um, and then I believe that the biggest concept, if, even if I had to get rid of everything else, I think the two biggest things for me when working with files is that I get to not work with migrations, which are a pain, as anyone that's known or had to use a database is that migrations are awful sometimes, especially when you're working with multiple versions at once and you're juggling lanes and you're just trying to get this last sprint out and you're testing stuff and then you realize we didn't migrate anything and we need to restart. So that's one. And two is version control, which kind of goes along with migrations and backups, but you can use Git with flat files. There's your version control. There's no more, oh, I need to do this archiving and backing up that's going to take forever. It's when was the last Git check-in done? When was it, when did I do that? That's my version control. So when we take out that database and we push in a file system, we change what the content management system is into a flat file content management system. So when we think about content, boom, there's a file. When we think about users, file, configuration, file, caching, files, files, files. So when looking at flat file content management systems, there's three that really stand out. And I've listed those three there. 
I consider them the most refined because they have great communities and everything starts with a great community. With great communities comes great examples and documentation and also help. Nothing's worse than coming across an open source solution that fits your need. You coming across the bug and then you sending out a, a request for assistance into the void and no one's working on it because it's effectively dead when it comes to the community. With these systems, that's not the case. There's incredible amount of community. So when you ask for help, they usually have an answer for you. Of these three, really quickly, uh, Grav is a free solution. They sell their plugins. That's how they make the money. Uh, Kirby has a small licensing fee, and Statamic has just a, a large upfront cost. So there are costs to these solutions, but you they're so small. When I say fee, I mean a flat fee of like $100 for the license for the life of that version for Kirby, for instance. When we talk about fees, usually when we're talking about things, it's it's thousands of dollars or a percent of uh, your your revenue. And when you're trying to create a system for yourself, you want something that's as cheap as possible. And when you're trying to create a system for your clients or future businesses, you still want low cost. And that's baked into flat file CMSs, basically because you get away from a huge database cost when you get to the enterprise level. Uh, which might not work out for your for your kind of company. When we look at flat file CMSs, there's about 40 that are relevant. Um, and this is that front end distribution. So however they choose to display the content is how I'm going to talk about front ends, whether or not that's a templating system or a completely different front end, like a whole solution would be something like React. Uh, most flat file systems are traditional. They're not decoupled. Uh, that means that you're going to probably use either PHP or a template system to build that HTML. We are kind of going back into the past a little bit, and that's a little bit different than what we're used to working with modernly. Uh, we're used to having a back end and a front end, and the front end makes an API request, and we can dynamically take that data, and we can generate stuff, and there's interactions. And I'm not saying you can't do that with flat file systems. I'm just saying there's a little bit more work to usually make that happen for whatever you pick. Most of these systems are going to say, get the data, look at the data, inject it in a template, send that template out to the user, and then um, that's their page. It's not like a single page application like we're used to. When we look at the back end distribution, we have sort of something interesting that's popping up. Uh, most are scripting languages, and most are a form of JavaScript or PHP. And I think that's for one reason, and that's really just to keep with the theme of easy development. Easy development, easy deployment, super essential when we're trying to keep costs low and try to keep the barrier of entry low as well. And JavaScript and PHP are just really easy to get set up on a shared server. I mean, if you've ever tried to deploy something that's not a scripting language to a shared server, it's not fun. <laughs> you know what's really fun? Taking your, taking your whole PHP module and just transferring it to the server and dropping it, and there you go. It's working. There's no need to compile anything. There's no. There's very few dependencies, and then those dependencies are usually bundled into your application to begin with. They just live in some sort of plug in our modules folder, right? And I, I think you might have noticed that there's one really big thing that's in common with not just the three choices that I showed or recommended, but also there is something in common with the front end and back end distribution. And that's PHP. And that's going to be my language recommendation if you look into flat file CMSs because of the benefits I said earlier, which is it works for the templating solution. It works to make it as easy as possible to deploy these applications. And there's just not much more work on top that you need to do to make it to make your site function and work. 
and there's great things to PHP. I know back then there's been a weird growth cycle for PHP, but ever since version eight, which came out a couple of years ago, they've made huge changes in both the speed, which was already fast, and the the ability to um, work with like a sane library. Uh, PHP didn't really have that in the beginning, and now they kind of do, which is really nice. Uh, you'll also notice that when you're looking at hosting your own site for as little as possible, there's nothing better than shared hosting. And those shared hostings almost always have some sort of PHP on them because they're usually used for the other content management systems like WordPress. So that's baked in. You're not going to have to pay for that. And so that's really beneficial. There are some downsides to PHP, mostly a little bit around like magical server configuration when you're first learning it. Dependency management's a little bit different than the niceties that we have with things like NuGet packages or Maven or NPM, which are really nicely refined. And PHP's got its own thing. It's just different, and that's OK. And then the last thing about PHP is that it's just a weird pack patchwork of interesting choices. It has some weird things that we're just not used to that feel weird, like dollar signs for variables, uh, the period for string concatenation. That's a weird one, too. And then namespace resolutions like a forward slash. Like They just use weird things, and it just kind of stuck for weird reasons. Uh, so when you're transitioning, it can feel really weird, but you'll adjust pretty quickly to it. When we look at these applications on a whole and as content management systems, and we're really thinking about the flow that our users have to go through from the beginning of the request all the way to when they get their content. And these systems aren't really any different. We still have our request. We still have our root where the routings where you know we parse that request, we try to figure out what do they want? Do they want a whole page or are they looking for something else? And we say, OK, well, we know this is what they want, so we're going to pull down these files, and we're going to pull down some of this other data. And then we're going to take that data, and we'll inject it into the template. And then we'll just serve it up to them. And there's the page. Um, and of course, with these services there, or these solutions, there's always other things you can do. There's still customization and reuse and easier things to do. But if you follow this basic flow, and if the the system satisfies this basic flow, then you have 90% of what you need done. Um, and so for a little bit of demonstrations following, I'll be using specifically Kirby CMS because that's what I use. But they're pretty much all the same when it comes to how they choose to set up like the basic, the middle, and the end of, of everything to make this whole content management system work. So again, we were talking about files. And most of the time, files are just going to be these things that are structured in such a way, usually through YAML, to give us the data that we want. In Kirby's, it's, it's a YAML file. It's just like JSON. It's just a different structure. Um, with the fields that we have that we want spelled out, followed by their values. So you can see here, this would be like a basic blog. Um, content file. We have the title of the blog. We have the text, uh, which would be like the body, right? Whatever we want it to be. Uh, maybe a cover image, the date it was published, who authored it, some fancy tags, and then a special thing to identify it, which would be like a UUID, right? That's pretty easy. That's easy. So when we're thinking about content, we don't really have to think about like, oh, is it like a var char 40? Is it going to have to have this weird thing where it's only ASCII characters? Do I need to think about, you know, the the, the numbers are, are only like positive to up to, you know, a million? Then I don't really need to worry about that too much uh, because I'm not trying to store it in a system that's going to try to take all that data and create amazing indexes and, and make it all fast. The system doesn't really care what you store in there. It's going to store it how you want it. And hopefully, when you retrieve it, you can parse it back out however you need it to be. So our content can be really simple. But then we have our templates, right? Um, our templates are, you know, in this case, it's just a PHP file that's going to inject certain content from that file, from that content file. It's going to inject it into the template, and that's going to serve it to the user. Um, it's pretty standard. It's it's easy to understand and wrap your head around without having to go into like 
oh man, how do I do use state or how do I figure out how to pass in the proper parameters and properties to my, my components? Uh, it's very easy to get up and going, which is beneficial. And then you have blueprints, and blueprints are a little bit weird, and every single system kind of deals with them differently and call them differently. But the idea is, okay, so I have content, and I have the template, but like, where's that admin part of my site where I can edit the content and make it and like kind of lay it out and see it in a way that means I don't have to just type into a file. And that's kind of what this idea is, is you'll have some sort of templating system specifically for the back end and, and working with like an, in an administrative way where you, you know, you set out again the fields that your particular content needs, uh, which can be anything, remember. Uh, and that's kind of the, the three things. That's really that's how simple it is. It's just if you have these three things, you can pretty much make the site work. If you have your content and your templates and a way to edit it in the back end, you have your content management system. You you satisfy those conditions that every content management system needs to have, which is how do I edit my content? How do I distribute it? And is does there, is there some sort of collaboration way that people can that aren't technically minded can work on this content creation, right? And then you can get into the other stuff too. That's there, you know, plugins, templating, caching other uh, functionalities to make development easier on the developer side, uh, but isn't strictly needed to get your site going. And so that kind of leads to the base reason for why this is so interesting and, and so important to realize it's there is that when we think of building these applications, a lot of the time we try to think of every single possibility that we need to cover. And I feel like when you're looking at the flat file system, it's so simple in what it tries to start out as that it gives you a different mindset when you're trying to set up your application and your project to say, what is the bare minimum I need to get this site up? What's the bare minimum templates and content that I need to make this successful. And you start out small. You don't need to worry about the database or any other thing. Just start out small, this tiny little backend, some content, some way to display it to your users, and you grow. You look at the other parts of your framework over time, and you say, wow, you know, if I introduce caching, will that help with my increase in users? I've been seeing an increase in users. And you just grow, and you grow a little bit more, and you say, wow, you know, my application is getting a little bit more complicated. I, it's getting heavier. I'm getting some more traffic in. Let's see if I can introduce this other small concept to my application. And I can build upon it because it's just a simple application. I know I just need this part. Boom, I'm going to slot in this little bit. Maybe at this point, I do need a responsive front end because for whatever reason, the content I'm trying to show people requires something that's not satisfied by just a static page. Maybe I want to be more interactive. Okay, that's fine. You take your application that you had, you turn it into a headless C or CMS, which again means I'm just going to take all that content and I'm going to serve it up as an API, and then I'll have a separate application that's going to consume it and then deploy and, and show it as my front end. Or maybe you just want to expand your application functionality and you look into ways of doing that too. And then you expand again because it's working. Whatever you're doing is working or you just need to make it bigger. And you say, okay, at this point, I think I need to in integrate a database into my application. That's fine. You can take all your flat files, you can turn it into an entire database. And now you have probably at that point, a standard application of a database, a back end, and a front end. And that's fine because at this scale, that's what you need. But in the beginning, that's not what you needed. And that's this architecture choice would have slown you down in the beginning, but it didn't because you didn't use this style yet until you actually needed it, until your needs grew beyond your stack choice. And so 
you know what what i know the common question is what can i do though with this what can i do with this information what can i do with a flat file cms and it's really anything that you want it's really a small business site a blog different apps for tracking daily things that you want to track that you'd say oh i really want to you know i want to track how fast my trees are growing in my yard okay cool well i could make this gigantic tree tracking application but i just need a couple of little files and i just need a little way to like display it to, to me and that's all i want well you can build you can realistically build something like that incredibly fast i bet you could probably figure it out in a day maybe two depending on how cool you wanted the front end to look right but it's also beneficial for quick demos to clients or quick demos that you want to show for your own necessities like i learned how to use Vue, but i needed a back end okay well i didn't really want to deal with setting up a database or working with another application so i'm gonna go with a flat file version of that so i can just focus on my front end i think that's the perfect use case for everyone but i think there's one other thing that's way beneficial for anyone getting into um any kind of development role or any, actually anything really is, I feel like everyone kind of needs a portfolio site. And to just show and demonstrate what you know uh, and to show that to you know per, uh, possible clients or your business. Um, and a portfolio site really works for everyone because again, it shows that to whoever you need. And using a flat file CMS is probably your best bet because of how easy it is to set it up, how uh, the low cost of actually distributing all that stuff or all, the, all your content and such. Um, and that is just an incredibly liberating tool to use to be creative. Um, this, this presentation was short and it really just focused on showing you a technology that you probably might not have been aware of and showing you some use cases and some benefits of using it over a standard application with databases. And I know the idea of working with a content management system, the first thing that people think of is, oh, content management systems are those things you use when you're setting up a shop or a blog. And while they work really great for those two use cases, they can be set up for anything the content is really just this box that you put whatever you need in. So you can track whatever you want. You can make it your own photo hosting site. You can do whatever you want with it. And I really do believe that this is probably the best solution uh, at small scales or medium scales um, to keep people accelerating, to keep people learning and to, to show off what you know. So, Thank you for listening. Uh, if there is a little bit of interest in actually setting up uh, a, a flat file CMS, I'm more than happy to put together a, a presentation that shows that, to show you know, how you get started, how you would deploy it, how everything really works. Um, and I appreciate all of your time today. Hey, Drew, I've got a question for you. Is that okay? Yeah, of course. Uh, what is there any kind of a demand in the job market out there for flat file CMSs? I don't know if there's specifically a demand that says, you know, here's our job application and have you ever worked with a flat file CMS? I think it's more about less about the, so the overall solution that they're asking for and more about those component parts. So the benefits for going out and learning a flat file CMS for your marketability, right, are for personal reasons, for keeping up with um, alternatives that could fit a, a smaller client to say, well, you really wanna get this going and that's great, but I think your use case is small enough to, to benefit from using this. And I think they might be pretty happy to have a smaller, easier to use system is one. Two is that the components of a flat file CMS are going to be applied throughout the job market, right? If you learn how to use PHP in a backend, that's a skill that is needed to, to manage other CMSs like a WordPress shop or Shopify or 
uh, no, Shopify is Ruby, um, other other CMSs. So you, you have that backend knowledge to apply in other jobs. And the same thing with the front end. Yes, if you know templating, that might not be used as much as a React front end. But again, there's nothing stopping you from setting your website up to be both a PHP CMS and that front end um, framework. So it's really about looking at those components and saying, wow, this application has these components that I can be, uh, I can use and be marketable with, rather than saying, are there any Kirby CMS jobs out there? Because you'll find a lot more jobs based off the components than you will the entire stack. That makes sense. Thanks. Appreciate it. Of course. Can you hear me, Drew? I can hear you now, Quinn. Uh, just a quick question of how the cloud fits into all of this flat file stuff. You mentioned the server setup and configuration maybe being uh, some disadvantage there. And with everyone wanting to be platform agnostic or platform cross-platform and wanting to go to the cloud, how does uh, flat file CMS play into that? Uh, pretty well, depending, again, on that use case, right? So. If your client's going to be distributed across the world and you need to have multiple instances of instances of servers working with the same files and cloning those files out i think you're going to run into the same problems that you do with databases which is trying to keep things concurrent and trying to reduce duplication of of um, un unnecessary duplication getting it to the cloud though is not as big a problem as you would assume, because as long as your file directory is set up, when you're in that instance, it's not a problem until you say, I have one over here, I have one across the world, and I need to keep them sunk or synced up, right? How do you do that? <laughs> uh, so there are there are some, some disadvantages there. Uh, but again, it depends on your client use case. If they can run off of a single server, you're not going to have any issues, just like you wouldn't have any issues with just a single database. Um, but yes, getting those set up and in the cloud, not an issue. Cool. Thanks. And I think I think that brings up an, another part is that people do want to get in the cloud because there are some great advantages, right? But there's still that that use case for those smaller businesses, for those medium applications to say, you don't really want to pace the the pricing for this. It's going to be ridiculously expensive to compare to what you want, right? Imagine a restaurant wants to set up a website for itself and it just wants a little bit more customization or it wants to build out its own solution, right? Rather than using some sort of off the shelf thing. Going to them and saying, yes, you're going to be paying several hundred dollars a month for hosting, or we could put you on a shared server because you maybe have like 300 people hitting your website every day, and that's going to cost you $30 <laughs> a month rather than several hundred dollars a month. Um, that works for them at that point. Uh, and I feel like that's a lot of businesses at this point is trying to reduce server costs. Um, and sometimes you can't get away from that in being in a, in a cloud solution. Are there uh, any other questions or any other follow-ups about flat file CMSs or CMSs or PHP uh, that I can try to answer or direct or create another presentation out of in case your question is a little bit too long? Are there any other fears when it comes to web development? Are there ideas that people have wanted to do in web development that they haven't had the time to do or they got into a traditional application and said this is just too much work?
Okay, well, that's great then. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. You can reach me on my email or Slack or however else you want to look or reach out to me, meet up. Uh, again, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for giving me your Tuesday to let me show you something that is pretty neat. Thank you, Drew, for your presentation. Thanks everyone for joining us today.